start with prayer and we will commence our sermon. Father in heaven, uh, we will not dare open your word and begin a sermon without approaching your throne of grace first. We ask for you, the wonderful, merciful Savior, to be with us, dwell with us, send your Holy Spirit as we study in Sabbath school, that he may teach us and guide us and lead us into a closer walk with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The name of our sermon is Just One Look. Just One Look. Just One Look. You ever heard that before? How many of you have heard that? There's a song with that title, Just One Look. I'm not going to say it. Just One Look, that's all it took and you know, it's amazing how much theology there is in music, even music that's secular. Just one look. That's the theme of our, our sermon, is one look to Jesus. Uh, there's another song you might be familiar with. Some of you uh, maybe more mature people back a few years ago, popular song by Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it? I mean, come on, admit it. How many remember that song? What's love got to do with it? She says, it's nothing but a secondhand emotion. What's love got to do with it? Well, these two songs kind of encapsulate the theme of our sermon this morning, Just One Book. And uh, I'd like to, if kind of, give you a little insight that if you look for it, there is good theology even in secular music. Sometimes. Not often, but sometimes. Um, when she said, when, when Tina Turner said that love is just a secondhand emotion, she was relating to the experience she had with her husband, Ike. And I don't think that anyone is unaware of the fact that he was very abusive to her. I mean, to the point of beating her and Domineering her, and that we we you know don't know what goes behind closed doors. What goes on behind closed doors? There are husbands that beat their wife physically, emotionally, in, in different ways, controlling them. Probably not because you know we're all uh, from a good Christian background, so we can't relate to that. By God, or can we? Um, wives subjugated by their husbands. And it might not be a physical beating, might not be a beat down, it, it might be emotional, it might be financial, it might be some other sexual, it, it, there's different ways that an abusive spouse can control the other spouse. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes it is the wife that is abusive to the husband, or the wife is abusive to the children, or the children can be abusive to the parents or to siblings. So I'm here to tell you that is not love. And yet the amazing thing is the one that is abused feels trapped in the situation. They, they don't know how to deal with it. They keep thinking it's going to get better, and guess what? It never gets better. It actually gets what? Worse. And then the, the, the thought is, well, God hates the Lord, so what do I do? And, I, and people are actually living in misery, but coming to church with a smile on their face. Because we don't know what goes on behind closed doors. God does. Amen. Amen. And when Tina said, love, that's just a secondhand emotion. She was not talking about love. She was talking about something that's the opposite of love. What you imagine is the opposite of love? That's 
the general answer that is given, but that is not a sound people, but you need a little more on this, a little more on the mic. Uh, that is really not the opposite of love. That's fruit of the opposite of love. Let me give you a clue. Let's define love. For say with me, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he, he did what? He gave his only begotten son. So that love of God, that God we love does what? It gives. Now tell me, what is the opposite of love? Taking in selfishness. Pride. And that's what she was dealing with. For years and years. Love is the key ingredient to relationships. Whether it's husband to wife, wife to husband, child to parent, parent to child, sibling to sibling, church member to church member. We might not all agree alike, but we can agree to disagree agreeably. Amen? So it's called tolerance. We need to be tolerant of one another. And we need not to judge one another. The Bible says, judge not, lest you yourselves be judged. And with whatever judgment you give to someone, that's going to come right back to you like a boomerang, and you will be judged by what you were judging someone else for. And Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 7, how dare you judge someone with a speck in their eye when you've got a beam sticking out of your eye? So it's best to take care of yourself. Amen? Amen. Look to Jesus to respect yourself. Love. Love. Key ingredient to all relationships, especially our relationship to our God. The story is told about a husband uh, A and a husband B. I'm going to look at two husbands here. Um, to compare them. Now, let's do husband B first. Husband B is a very successful business tycoon. He, he runs a thriving business and he's very busy. He's very, uh, very uh, full of, you know, progress and, you know, demands and schedules and so forth. He wants his business to, to really excel. He's very rarely home. Leaves early in the morning. Uh, comes back late at night. Uh, he and the wife might catch a glimpse of one another once in a while. So, all of a sudden, the, his uh, secretary reminds him, by the way, uh, your wife's birthday is tomorrow. He says, oh, okay, well, do the usual, would you please? So, the secretary orders flowers and some candy and has it delivered to the house with a little card, happy birthday. And so he comes home, forgot all about it, but he comes home, and all of a sudden there's a smile on her face. She's a daddy. He remembered. He remembered my birthday. And you know, folks, that, that's, that's an ongoing test, isn't it? It's always an ongoing test. The wife is thinking, I'm not going to tell this my birthday, but I'm going to see if he remembers. And so, and the husband, I hopefully we do remember, the husband's not going to let her know that he knows that it's her birthday because he wants her to be in a little bit of suspense for a while. So he never says a word, and she never says a word, and she's thinking, oh, two days he hasn't said a word about it, uh, one day he hasn't said a word about it, he's probably forgotten about it. And then all of a sudden, the day of her birthday, he remembers. So he passed the test. This particular husband kind of cheated. His secretary bought the flowers and the candy and the cards. So that's husband B. Now I want to ask you, let's read husbands. Was was that an A plus husband or is that an F? Was that a failure of a husband? A or F? F. A? Yeah. How many say F? He was a failure of a husband. Here's another husband. This is husband A. Now husband A loves his wife very, very, I'm not saying B didn't, but A really, really, he loves her, he cherishes her, and he demonstrates that love often. Now, birthday time is coming up. He realizes that. He's made metal note. He knows every, the anniversary, the birthday, all of these things, you know. He remembers. But she is, once again, testing him to see if he'll remember. 
So about a week ahead of time, he's made some plans, and he goes to work on the day of her birthday. He hasn't said a word. And she said, hmm. Well, if he hasn't mentioned by now, I know he's forgotten, so she just gave up on the whole idea. He goes to work, comes back from the office, and he said, you know what? It's a beautiful day. This is upstate New York. Have you ever heard of Watkins Glen? The racetrack Watkins Glen, New York? This is a beautiful day. Honey, you know, what are you doing home from work? You know, it's just so nice. I don't want to waste a day. Well, let's take a bike ride. Let's go to Watkins Glen. Okay, so she got on her Harley gear, and he got on his Harley gear, and they drive to Watkins Glen. Now, at Watkins Glen, not only is there a racetrack, it's a beautiful tourist area. They have balls there and gorge. It's just absolutely gorgeous. The gorge, they light it up. It's beautiful. So they also have this tour boat, this paddle boat that goes around the lake. And she always wanted to go on that boat ride, and it wasn't his cup of tea, so they never did. So anyway, they drive to, on the highway to Watkins Glen, he intentionally parks his motorcycle right in front of the, the, the dock where you get onto the boat, never says a word, and he says, well honey, let's go across the street and get something to eat. And so she's looking longingly toward the boat, she wants on that boat so badly, and he starts to walk across it. He said, wait a minute. No, I've changed my mind. And he says, oh, look what I have in my pocket. I have two tickets for that boat ride. And she, her face lit up. And she was so ecstatic. It's like you just gave her a mink coat or, or diamond ring or something or, or Porsche or whatever. She was ecstatic. Now she's going to get out of the boat ride. He says, oh, by the way, I have these. He pulled out some flowers from the saddlebag. It was a little wilted. And the candy, slightly melted. And a gift. And he says, by the way, happy birthday. Oh, she, she was just euphoric. And they went on the boat ride. And we had, she had a great time. I knew it. Uh, why did I go on that boat ride that, I mean, it was going like about one knot an hour, and you could almost feel the breeze, and said, well, we'd be on the deck to, hold on, really, maybe this is going to get intense, you know, <laughs> it's barely moving. Didn't we see that tree for the last 20 minutes, and you know, there's another tree to look at, I'm sure. But she loved it, and that made him happy. He did it because why? He loved her. Husband A, husband B. Now, let's read husband A. How many say that he did a good job? Thumbs up? Okay. Um, I won't even ask you the other option. <laughs> husband here's another, you know, the battle of the sexist story. So, this couple's having dinner in the restaurant, and the wife is, you know, usually ladies are looking around, and, you know, uh, I think, it, this is not a sexist statement, I think it's very logical that when women go to restaurants, it's more of a social occasion. When men go to restaurants, it's more business. Let's eat. Amen, guys? That's why you're there. Anyway, I've noticed, you know, I'm a bachelor, and I go to restaurants I used to eat before, go to the other lot, and I observe people. And, and I would see people come in, and, you know, the first thing they do, they, they say yes to the wait staff, they order the drink, and their heads do what? They're texting right across the table. They, they're not even talking to each other, you know. And so, and I know some ladies go to have dinner together. They are chatting the whole, they're having a grand time. They barely eat the food. They're busy talking. Because why? This is a social occasion. To me, it's business. <laughs> Let's get down to the food. But anyway, so here the wife is looking around. The husband is drinking uh, his drink, eating his soup and the salad, waiting for the main meal. He's busy. She's looking around. She notices a couple in the corner. The couple in the corner are a young couple, very amorous with one another, hugging each other, and he's whispering in her ears, and she blushes, and she whispers something back to him. He pecks her on the cheek. Once he even got old enough to kiss her on the mouth, you know, in public, 
and the wife is, oh, she is taken by that, you know. And she said, honey, can you see that couple over there? He looks up, yeah, goes back to the suit. And, she, and she's upset. And I said, do you get what I'm trying to tell him? And, and uh, she said, honey, did you, I said, did you see that? He said, yes. She said, why can't you do that? He said, honey, I don't even know her. <laughs> the battle of the sex. Husband and husband would be. Um, love. The Beatles sang a song about love. There's a lot of theology in music. It's all about love. So my question to you is, in relationship to God, who is God in your mind? A tender-hearted parent or a cruel, tyrannical judge like a Georgia cop waiting to pull you over and write you off? Who is God? Our perspective of God, how we view God, will shape and determine our theology, obviously, our relationship with Him, our demeanor, our relationship with others, and even ultimately our eternal destiny. How do you and I view God? That's what it's all about. The crime lord was asked, Boss, what would you rather have your gang do? Fear you or love you? What do you think his answer was? Fear. Well, you know, fear does have uh, a controlling influence for a short time, temporarily. But after that, there is resentment and rebellion. You know, I, I've seen families as a pastor in church where teenagers were actually, you know what is the worst addiction known to mankind? The worst addiction? Do you have a guess? An idea? <coughs> religious. Religious addiction. It's, it can become very brutal. Children are subjugated. You can't do this. You can't do that. You have to do the other. No, I just saw what you just did. That's not acceptable. You know, they are subjugated. And they might be controlled while they're home, but when they leave home, guess what's going to happen? They are going to rebel. So many kids break free and go to the wild side. Fear does control temporarily, but creates resentment and rebellion in the heart. Love, on the other hand, engenders devotion, admiration, love, loyalty, and a desire to serve. You know the Bible speaks when it says the word love. The Bible is actually referring to three different categories or types of love. You realize that, right? The most basic love is eros. Adam knew Eve, and they started having children. That is intimacy, that physical love. But from God's perspective, it's pure and it's good. It's holy, it's sanctified. It's healthy sexual expression. Can I get an amen? amen. The, another level of love is phileo, which is like brotherly love. Friend to friend, uh, girlfriend to girlfriend, you know, neighbor to neighbor, church member to church member, that is another type of love. Like a brotherly love. Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love. Then the ultimate love, the highest form of love, is agape. And that is God's love. Unselfish love. That love loves the person of their uh, focus more than they care about themselves. They rather do without and to be there for the one that they love. They would take a bullet for their loved one. They would go to the cross for the human race. That's Jesus. For God so loved the world. Say it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. That's a God they love. The highest type of love the Bible speaks of. With that background in mind, I'd like to introduce you to someone by the name of Star David. True story, historical figure. Two R's, if you want to look him up, Star Daily. 
uh, D-A-I-L-Y, Star Daddy. Uh, he lived a while ago during the time of, you know, before the Depression. Um, back in the night, early 1900s. And during that era of our history, there were many violent crime wars who ruled with an iron hand, or should I say, a gun-toting fist. Such mobsters as Al Capone, Babyface Nelson, Bonnie and Clyde, Pretty Boy Floyd, John Dillinger, and now, of course, another crime war, Star Day. That's his name, Star Day. Um, these monsters trafficked, back then it wasn't so much drugs, it was alcohol, food flaking alcohol during the time of prohibition. Uh, or they sold insurance. It wasn't like um, health insurance, well you could say it was health insurance, it wasn't really life insurance, but you could say it was life insurance, but it was insurance that the mob would not destroy their business or kill them, so pay us money and we won't hurt you. That type of insurance. Uh, also, very common during th that type of culture was bank robberies and a host of other violent crimes. Star Daly was born actually in the late 1800s, grew up uh, and became part of this crime-ridden landscape of American history. He was abandoned by his mother, left to the tortures of his alcoholic, abusive father, who abused him physically, mentally, and emotionally. Star never experienced genuine love not even brotherly love. Only hatred, violence, rejection from his father. He became, obviously, you know, there's a Bible passage that says, 1 Corinthians 3.18, 3, by beholding, we become change. Well, when you behold that hatred, violence, this model to your everyday of your life, how's that going to affect you? Star became that violent person like his father. He exuded hatred and violence. He was violent with everyone he came into contact with. He wanted to be the most feared person that ever lived. He wanted to strike fear on him, even law enforcement. He had been arrested several times, even as a teen. He emulated the likes of Al Capone, John Dillinger, Machine Gun Kelly. He loved and admired the way they struck fear in the hearts of citizens and even the police. He wanted to be the type of man that when he entered the town, every citizen would run and hide from fear, and even the police would shudder and turn the other way. His specialty was robbing banks. He was talented as the greatest safe cracker of all time. He said, there's not a safe that I can't crack. He excelled in his trade. He and his gang had successfully robbed a series of banks. Ultimately, he was caught and arrested, sentenced to a long prison term. This is what the judge said as I was reading in history about him. Quote, this is the judge. Prison is the wrong place for you. You are sick. And there is no help for your kind of sickness. You are violent, dangerous, and hateful. A menace to society. I don't know what to do with you other than to remove you from society. Jail is even too good for you, but that's where you're going. So he's arrested and sentenced to long term. Everyone, including himself, thought he was beyond rehabilitation, without hope in this world. While in prison, oh, that was a great place for him to be. Because he had a lot of people he could hate and beat up. He loved to fight. And so he was constantly fighting with inmates and guards, tried to escape twice, once by causing a riot. The warden said to him, you know what? You're not even safe in jail. We're going to send you to the hole. But solitary confinement, a dark, dead, dead cell, eight foot by eight foot, in the bowels of the prison, with only a tiny shaft of light piercing the darkness. Shackled to manacles, and suspended from the ceiling, he was forced to stand 12 hours every day. Now, on the other hand, at 6 a.m., the guards would come in and give him some water and a piece of bread. Bread and water. Then cuffed again to the ceiling. 
On Shabbat at 7 p.m., I'm sorry, 6 p.m., was he had given bread and water and left to lie on a dirty floor. His hatred, therefore, he endured this for 15 days. He was stronger and stronger. He hated the police, the six witnesses that testified against him, the jury, the judge that sentenced him, the warden, the inmates, the guards, especially one of the guards by the name of Bull. The guard was signed to the hole. So after 15 days of this torture, he could no longer stand up when released from the cuffs uh, and do uh, swollen feet malnourishment. They left him. He couldn't even eat. He fell on the ground, half unconscious. While lying there on the floor, his half-dead and nearly unconscious star, his body sensed a presence. Someone was in the cell with him. He didn't know who it would be. He was thinking it was Bull coming back to beat him. So he gathered the energy to turn and look, and it wasn't Bull. It wasn't another guard. Do you have an idea who it was? It was Jesus. Do you know that Jesus goes to jail? Jesus visits, and I used to have a prison ministry in Elmira, New York. It was a very, uh, it, it was a, what do you call it, a massive security prison for the hardest criminals. And every Thursday I'd go there and I had six to seven inmates I'd study with because they are an eclectic group of people. And God wants someone to reach out to them and give them hope. So no one came to see stars, so Jesus said, well, I'll do it. And Jesus went to the hole to be with star. And while he was there, now keep in mind, Jesus never said a thing. He just compassionately looked upon the form of Star lying on the ground. And Star looked at Jesus. Just one look! He looked at Jesus, and he saw in his eyes and his face compassion, love, sympathy. He saw Jesus having tears well up in his eyes at, at the condition Star was in. And it, it, it was like maybe a 15 second, 30 second experience, but the Star seemed like hours. He heard about this Jesus. He knew something about him, very little, but something about him. And just that look reaffirmed that there is a God in heaven, and he does love me, and he does care about me. He's here to visit me. And he loves me. I can see tears in his eyes. There's hope for even me. I am loved. I am accepted by Christ. And I am forgiven. Just one look. Just one look. I told you that song has theology in it. Jesus, intense gaze, bore deep into Star's soul. Not only quote Star about that experience. Quote, in that look, it was as if Jesus projected such intense love and forgiveness that it pulled the plug from my feet and all the black, toxic hatred of my soul drained out. It was gone. And I was changed, now filled with the love of God. Just one look. Star knew that Jesus was real and that he loved him and had forgiven him of all his sins. He was a new person now full of love for Jesus. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 2 Corinthians, if you have your Bibles, it would be good to turn to it. Otherwise, it would be on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. By the way, Steve, I want to see you after church because I want to see your Bible again. I'm trying to get a hold of a copy of it. He's got the common English version. That is a beautiful read. I want to see it again, okay? Um, and this is what it says. If anyone is in Christ, I'm going to quote it from the New King James. If anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There is hope. There's hope for anyone and everyone. There's hope for criminals. 
There's hope for dictators. Then there was hope for Nebuchadnezzar, dictator of his era. He got saved, read Daniel 4. Those who become Christians become new persons. They're not the same anymore, for the old life is gone, and the new life has been given to them. Listen to Star's life. Star stopped hating, started projecting the unconditional love of Jesus to all of his enemies. That would mean everyone had a plan, because they're all his enemies formally. That would include the guards who mistreated him, the inmates, the six witnesses that testified against him, the judge who sentenced him, the warden, and even, guess who? Bull. Even Bull. Uh, the character of transformation was so dramatic that he was, you know, he was praying for everyone. They come in to feed him. They say, God bless you. <laughs> what did you just say? Well, I'm praying for you. God bless you. I'm praying for your salvation. They thought it was just a trick. He's trying to maneuver them so he could, you know, beat them up again. But he meant it. He says, I love you. I'm praying for you. So the transformation was so dramatic, he got back to the warden, he removed him from the hole, and was put in another cell with a lifer who happened to be a Christian. You know, there are Christians in jail. And this lifer was well versed in scripture, and he became the mentor to start who was like a dry sponge, absorbing as much knowledge of scripture as he could. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing from the word of God. Amen? Thy word have I hid my heart that I may not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light unto my path. Scripture is transformational. If we would spend time with Jesus in prayer and study his word and witnessing, we would become giants of faith. Amen. Star faithfully prayed for all of his enemies. The Bible says he was forgiven much, loves much. Remember that story about the woman that anointed the feet of Jesus in his head with oil, the alabaster box? Simon was convicted, thought to himself, Jesus only knew what a wretched woman that is. Some, some, some woman off the streets, he wouldn't have anything to do with her. And then Jesus answered his thoughts and said, You know what, Simon? He was forgiven much, loves much. Amen. You see, the self-righteous don't have the depth of love that those righteous like us, reprobates like us, who were saved by Christ, we realize what he's done for us and is doing for us. Our love is, is intense for Jesus. Listen to this. The outcome? Saved. Everyone. The police, the resident, the witnesses, the jury, the judge, the warden, the inmates, and guess who? Even more. God saved. Star was eventually released and early uh, than his sentence demanded, and then he began his testimony. He was preaching wherever he went. There's two books written about his life, one called Release, the other, Love Can Open Prison Doors. Once again, I asked the church, Tina's question, rhetorical question, what's love got to do with it? And what is the answer? Everything. It's all about love. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. Amen. I don't know if you've ever heard of Matthew West. Talented songwriter and singer, Matthew West. He wrote a song called Forgiveness. It was based on a true story. This, this mom was grieving the loss of her two daughters. They were in an automobile accident. A drunk driver hit them head on. He survived, they didn't. He was incarcerated, manslaughter, uh, vehicular manslaughter, had a long prison term. And she hated him. She was a Christian, but she hated him. He killed her daughters. Only time God was working on her heart. And she said, you know what? Let me just go to visit him and and just let him know he's a human I, I want to care about. At first he refused to see me. The second time he refused. To, finally he said, okay, I'm just she's gonna scream at me, let me just get it over. So he made an agreement to meet with her. And in the visiting room, 
she sat down and she said to him, I'm here to tell you that my heart is still broken with the loss of my daughters. He thought, here we go. Here goes the lecture. And she said, but I'm here to also tell you that God has been working in my life so that I can forgive you and love you and I've been praying for you. I want you to know that I love you. I know you didn't do that intentionally, but I love you and I'm praying for you. She got up what? The second visit, the same, the third visit. Finally, they started really developing a relationship. And after the relationship went on for some time, his demeanor changed in jail. He was released early. And then the two of them got together and were lecturing all over against drunk driving and so forth and his testimony of salvation and forgiveness. And Matthew West wrote the song called Forgiveness. If you hear it, it will break your heart. It's beautiful. Forgiveness. I call to the witness stand another witness. A teenage girl, young teenage girl, desiring to please God and to be saved for heaven, but desperately afraid of God. She was overwhelmed with her inadequacies and hopeless uh, that God could ever love her or allow someone like her to heaven. This teenage girl. Now she and her twin sister were the youngest of eight. She was born in Dora, Maine on the 26th of November, 1827, into a Christian home. Her family then moved to Portland, Maine shortly thereafter and traumatized one day at the age of eight when the age of eight Mark that, and this is now 1835, on her way to school she found a little piece of paper indicating that Jesus was soon to return in a few years. Hmm. 1835. What is that close to? 1844. And so that traumatized her. You think she would be excited and happy, but she was a fearful. She says, quote, I was seized with tear, terror. Such a deep impression was made upon my mind that I could scarcely sleep for several days and pray continually to be ready when Jesus came. Uh, another quotation, there was in my heart a feeling that I could never be worthy to be called a child of God. She went on to say, it seemed to me that I was not good enough to enter heaven. Have you ever thought that way? Don't put your hand up. I have. I still do. I know me. But I know someone else who knows me. And his name is God. His name is Jesus. And he loves me so much he died on the cross for me. I don't deserve heaven, but he wants me there. That works for me. So she sensed that she wasn't good enough. She was under the pressure. She had to be good enough, perfect, before God, sinless, perfection. She had to do everything right, never make a mistake. She also thought that if she were truly saved, she would experience ecstasy and a feeling of euphoria. Then in the summer of 1841, six years after finding that little piece of paper, she's now 14, while at a Methodist camp meeting, we don't own camp meetings, by the way, at a Methodist camp meeting with her family in Buxton, Maine, she heard a statement that emphatically stated, quote, all self-sufficiency and effort were worthless in gaining favor with God. That it's only by connecting with Jesus by faith that the sinner becomes a hopeful, believing child of God. It's not by works. It's by grace. She said, all the language in my heart was, help me, Jesus, save me where I perish. Another quotation, suddenly, my burden left me and my heart was light. Amen. Later, though, she relaxed. It was, she started thinking, it's too good to be true. She quote, quote, she says, it seemed to me that I had no right to feel joyous and happy. Distress and guilt became her constant companions. Thus she continued to vacillate between God's love and grace versus guilt, doubt, and insecurity. Has that ever happened to you? Don't answer Legalism, guilt, shame, and unworthiness is the default setting in our minds due to the sinful nature. 
What's the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they sinned? What did they do? They felt shame. They hid themselves. Shame and guilt, remorse, and they sewed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. Legalism. Every one of us has that default setting in the computer. Even those of us that understand Jesus, understand the cross, understand grace, we have that default setting. And we have to fight, at least I have to fight that every day of my life. Because I realize what I am. I'm, by the way, who am I? I'm a nobody <laughs> trying to tell everybody about somebody who saved my soul. But I realize I'm unworthy, but Jesus' worthiness covers my inadequacies. Grace seemed too good to be true. We don't we feel we don't deserve it. In reality, we don't, but God dispenses it anyway because He loves us. Then there's another preacher that impacted her thinking. She heard of a man by the name of William Mill. Have you ever heard of him before? In Portland, Maine, during a series in 1840, she returned in June of 1844 to learn more. Now she's 15 years of age. She fully accepted the message of Miller, but couldn't shake the nagging fear that she wasn't good enough. She wrestled, another thing she wrestled with, with the teaching of eternally burning hell. Do you know that's one of the greatest lies of the devil? And how many people he's keeping from the kingdom with that lie born in the cauldrons of hell? She wrestled with that. How could that be consistent with the God of love? She eventually slipped into a state of a mental, troubled mate, mental state. Her mother suggested that she seek counsel with a Methodist minister, Pastor Levi Stockman, also a millerite. He explained to her, of the, you know who I'm talking about now, right? He explained to her of the love of God for his erring children, and that indeed, instead of rejoicing in their destruction, he got longed to draw them to himself in simple faith and trust. Such as Jeremiah 31 3, I have loved thee with an everlasting love and loving kindness. I have drawn thee to myself. She's realizing this. John 12 32, Jesus spoke, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all unto me. Jesus said in Matthew 11 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Stockton dwelt on the great love of Christ and the plan of redemption. She, he said to her, go free. Return to your home, trusting in Jesus, for he will not withhold his love from any true believer. From that point on, at the age of 15, she looked upon God as a tender parent rather than a stern tyrant compelling her to blind obedience. Romans 8.14 I'm going to turn there quickly, Romans 8.14. Paul has the same theme that we need to be reminded of often. Romans 8.14. Let's read this all out together. For as many as I led by the Spirit of God, these did it say might be? If you pay enough tithe and keep enough Sabbaths, well, what does it say? Are the sons of God. Keep reading. Verse 15. For you did not receive, out loud, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again. Uh, to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out what? Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit we are the children of God. Amen. Her heart went out to God in deep love and fervent obedience. Obedience is not something she had to do, something she wanted to do. It was a joy for her. It was a pleasure to serve God. Like the story of that alabaster box in the Gospel of John. She now sets grace and acceptance by, acceptance by God as his child. She now had the assurance of her salvation based on grace, not her performance and obedience. 
So many of us are still trying to get good enough to be saved. Honey, you're already saved by grace. Can we please understand that and internalize that and move forward, not to salvation, but from salvation and grow spiritually? She had the assurance that salvation was based on grace, not performance. She looked upon now forward to the second coming of Jesus with enthusiasm. She realized she had nothing to fear from such a being, a kind, tender, loving parent, but everything to hope. Having the assurance of salvation by grace, not works, that anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, was any man should boast. She had an excitement and longing for the Perusia, the return of Christ. She had peace and confidence by trusting that in Jesus she had nothing to fear. Having a love for others, even those unkind to us. John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Why? When you have love one for another. So what's love got to do with the church? Everything. It begins with loving God. The two great commandments we studied in Sabbath school. For the Lord uh, said, Matthew uh, 22, verse 37, he was asked, which is the greatest commandment? He says, well, I'll give you two. I'll give you a bonus. The first great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Vertical. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. That was the summation of the Ten Commandments. And the two is the summation of the one commandment of love. Whoever knows, loves not, knows not God. For what? God is love. The Bible says, And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Just one look at Jesus, and I be, I be lifted up, Looking into Hebrews 12, 2, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Back to Tina Turner. She never knew love, she knew abuse. She knew a self centered, dictatorial, abusive expression called love. That was not love. But ladies and gentlemen of the church, I'm here to tell you that we are unworthy, but recipients of God's love is a God we love. Amen. So once we embrace that and understand that, our lives will be changed, transformed, and we will be the ambassador of His kingdom that God has spoken to us to do. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have demonstrated that love. You not only gave us thought, the theology, the theory, but you lived it out. You came to us, the undeserving. You lived a perfect life on our behalf and then bowed to cross and died in our place. What greater act of love could ever be demonstrated other than that? And we praise you for that. And may we relish in that and may that be the guiding influence of our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.